We really appreciate you giving us a little bit of time today. We had a sold out room for this session, but um, as expected, when you've spent a couple of days at an intense conference, it's the true, the proud, the committed that are showing up today, and that's you. So we really appreciate you doing that. For those of you in the back, feel free to come forward. Uh, I made sure to wear a little bit of extra cologne today, so, uh, and tend to have good hygiene, so feel free to, uh, to head up if you'd like to. Uh, I'm really excited for the time that we have with you today because we're gonna spend some time with three incredible founders that are really solving very complex problems. They're doing so in a very unique way, and so what we're gonna do today is have a pretty free-form conversation, if that's all right, with a focus on a little bit of tech, a little bit of capital raising, a little bit of lessons learned, a little bit on leadership, and for those of you that are startup founders yourselves, ideally you'll take at least one solid nugget away from what is definitely some incredible leadership here on the stage. So I'm, I'm really excited for the time that we have with you. So thanks again for that. So let me do a quick introduction so that you can have an idea of, uh, of who's here. I am not Braun, by the way. Um, so just did want to let you know that uh, I am Darren Mori, and I get to lead a business here in North America focused on our startup organization, creating a, a high level of service and a great support model for our founders. The three folks that I have here on stage are the, really this, the center of the show today, and I want to go through and one quickly just tell you about, uh, or at least introduce Aparna and Lynn and Mona, but rather than me take the wind out of their sails, I'd much rather us start with them having the chance to tell you about them, giving you a little bit of an idea of the companies that they've started and the problems they're solving. So if it's all right, Aparna, I'll start with you. Awesome. Can you all hear me? Hear you perfectly. Perfect, okay. So, hey everyone, my name is Aparna, uh, one of the founders at Arise. Arise was founded in 2020, Series B, um, and I, should I go into like why I started Arise? Yeah, if you tell okay. us a little bit about Arise, if you would, and then we'll yeah. get into the, yeah. So, Arise is an ML observability platform. So, we help monitor AI, troubleshoot when it doesn't work, and then help you root cause why your models aren't performing the way that they should be. Um, I got into this problem because I was an ML engineer for many years, most recently at Uber. I launched a lot of models, so if you've ever taken an Uber ride and your ETA wasn't right, yeah, that's <laughs> probably someone that's on my good. team. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we deployed a lot of models into production. And just like software, when you deploy models into the real world, they may not go as expected. And we only found out about that when we lost revenue. Um, and so felt the pain myself, got pulled into many meetings to help explain why our models weren't working, and that's what got me to want to start a company around ML observability. So the elevator pitch is Datadog for ML. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Hey, Mona, if you wouldn't mind doing the same thing. Should I take her elevator pitch and say Datadog for data? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So Mona Rakibek, co-founder, CEO of Telmai. Telmai is a data observability uh, company. So I had a different pitch, but I'll first try to tell how different are we So from upper now. So first thing is when you are bringing in data, you have complex data pipeline from ingestion to consumption. A lot of these consumptions could be your ML model. Across the pipeline, a myriad of things can happen, and we help apply AI techniques to check your data for anomalies, errors, outliers. Uh, Telmai is two and a half year company, state stage uh, company. Uh, both Max and me, my co-founder Max Lukicha, we had spent a lot of time in the data ecosystem. And what we realized is that in spite of the spend in data infrastructure, companies struggle to get the right ROI on the data because they don't have the trust in the data that's fueling your ML and AI and analytics use cases. So. We started, we got heads on into this, got seed round of funding, have great customers, and we have partnership built across Snowflake, Databricks, Google. That's my Excellent. quick introduction. Excellent. And Lynn, I had the chance to meet you, and we had a session on demystifying AI. I really appreciate that. It feels like it was years ago, but it was yesterday, just so you know, when we did that session. <laughs> but I'd love for you to tell these folks what you've been working on and all about uh, Fireworks. Yeah. Sure, and I feel I can integrate with both of your companies. <laughs> <laughs> so we are building integrations right Perfect here. End to end. Uh, so I'm Lynn, I'm co-founder CEO of Fireworks.ai. Uh, our focus is to lift all frictions uh, for um, product engineers create product disruption. 
uh, building on top of GenAI. The biggest friction we are lifting first is deploy GenAI models into production because those models are extremely big compared with traditional machine learning models, XGBoost, um, linear regression is huge. Um, and the traditional infrastructure are not equipped uh, to drive performance and drive cost to serve. Uh, those are the typical questions we heard from so many companies. And they tune the model, they train the model, it's good quality, but it just got blocked. I deployed these models into production. Uh, when their business scales into a huge amount of um, users, uh, and they run into a problem because the cost is so high, and then you can to get so much higher ROI to justify uh, the benefit of using uh, those models. So we help them to completely remove that concerns, and we deliver the best uh, of the breed performance and the cost to serve, because the background we have here is um, I led PyTorch team at Meta in the past five years. Um, I started Fireworks with a group of engineers, PyTorch engineers. Um, they have been building PyTorch code uh, forever, and uh, in the GNI space, all these models are PyTorch models. Um, we feel kind of our expertise has been um, used to extreme to, to help all our engineers to be productive in this space. Excellent, thank you so much. I want to dig in, Mona, maybe we'll start with you if that's all right, and we'll talk about the, the concept of obviously startups go through a life cycle and a journey, and that upfront journey focused on kind of concept and ideation to first product, to kind of getting that MVP shipped is obviously a super critical stage. Can you share a little bit of insight with folks in the room around that stage, that process for you, and how did you transition from concept to product? Uh, that's great. So, so we knew a lot about the problem statement. Having worked in data ecosystem, uh, my co-founder had worked at observability for our infrastructure observability company, SignalFX. So we had ideas of how to solve it. We had understanding of customer's pain point. But some wise man told me that you should talk to five, 10 people still, even though you may have a lot of conviction, keep validating constantly. I do that even till now. We wanted to optimize for pace fast, right? So uh, I'm proud to say even our prototype was built on GCP, to be honest, like uh, GKE and started. So we wanted to focus on what we want to validate first. So we started building a prototype which really focuses on can we use statistics, machine learning to detect anomalies and figure out at scale what's going wrong with the data. So we used the services from GCP, built out a prototype, we used BigQuery, uh, Looker. We literally pushed out our dashboards to customers to validate. We didn't build anything, so we had used uh, Looker dashboards to even validate with customers, take real-time feedback and then started design partnering and building out and launched the product. So we did a lot of like uh, ha uh, working together with our customers before we launched anything into the market. So that was uh, optimizing for fast, leveraging, focusing on what you know best and validating that first and leveraging ecosystem for other things. That's what great. we did and how, that's how we started on the That's journey. great, thank you for that insight. And Aparna, maybe same to you, when you think about the journey that you took your company through in the early stage, what would be a couple of insights or lessons learned that you could share with these folks about concept to first product? Yeah, I don't even know where to start, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think there's one thing which is interesting. So there's selling to the enterprise and then there's selling AI. And for us, the, the key nuances is like, well, who's doing AI? It's typically not a startup that are three or four people. Mm -hmm. Like when you think about like that Y Combinator, hey, sell to other startups and then you slowly will eventually build up and you'll sell to bigger and bigger enterprises. I think for data and AI companies, you have to think about, well, who has your problems? And for us, it's probably larger enterprises mm -hmm. who have our problems. I mean, there, there are mid-market and we do have market customers, um, startup customers, but I think a vast majority are probably in the enterprise kind of group. And well, what do enterprise need? I think the, the there's, you know, rolling out an MVP is important, but there's a lot more that goes into selling into an enterprise than just having an MVP half-baked product. Mm -hmm. um, and so, similar to Mona, we also started on Google Cloud um, GKE especially, like my CTO would say, he didn't even need an operations team when he first yeah. began because 
whatever you would have had four or five engineers doing, GKE just helped them quickly get up and get running. Okay. Um, but we, we shipped fast. Mm -hmm. Like that's the first thing you could do is like get your product out fast, test it as quickly as you can in the market. We did everything from, even if we just had Figma mocks, we would go and show Figma mocks to potential customers and say, this is what's rolling out. This is what's coming out. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it helped us kind of, even though we thought we had an idea of what we, what we wanted to build, I had felt the pain myself. Mm -hmm. It's different when you pitch it to, like Mono was saying, 10, 15 other ML engineers or data scientists and they start to make you think, oh, maybe the way I thought of the solution in the beginning isn't right. And so right. the quicker we got the product out, the more feedback we got out, I think fast as possible to shipping to test it mm -hmm. was really important for us. Um, so, so that's more on like the technical, the product building. I think there's a whole component of like go to market mm -hmm. that as a technical founder, you just have never done before. Mm. Um, and, and so- how, how did you go about getting that assistance or, or knowing what you needed to know to perfect that go to market? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing we, I really tried to do was like, well, who's our customer? Um, when you're selling to AI enterprises, um, it was early in the market. There wasn't a, there, there's two types of companies I like to think. There's category defined, category creating, mm -hmm. and then there's kind of like category, I don't know, dis, maybe it's like a next gen or disrupting. So category creating is that there's no product on the market like yours before. So you have to create a need. Mm -hmm. There's not a budget for a product like yours. Cool and course. so what we had to do was, um, uh, who, who was our buyer? Well, our buyer, we knew our user was gonna be ML engineer and data scientist. Mm -hmm. They're the people who own, if models break in production or they don't perform as well in the real world, they have to own the consequences. Mm -hmm. But who makes the, who's the economic buyer? Who's gonna ultimately buy a product like that? And so we started to realize that you could sell to, um, call it ML platform teams. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of like, you know, when you have DevOps, uh, DevOps centralization, which has happened, we, we had kind of similar industries to look at and say, well, there's centralization of ML platforms. That could be one buyer. Or we could just start to sell to one team and then eventually grow and eventually you know, be the solution across an entire enterprise. And so I think it takes a while as, as a technical founder to figure out what's your go-to-market strategy? Mm -hmm. What's your, how are you gonna reach developers? Um, and that, that I'd say is, uh, is you, you want to get in, similar to shipping product, it's also how quickly can you shape your messaging? How quickly iterate can you, over and over. Iterating yeah. over and over. And so that's, that's another train of iteration that's Excellent. kind of happening in parallel. I think that's powerful. We talk so much about technology iteration, to your point, and uh, the flywheel of change and being customer-centric from a product and capability perspective. But great reminder that your go-to-market and your value prop should equally be iterating yeah. at the same pace. Lynn, kind of off script, right? And, and same question for you. When you think about the early days of you creating your go-to-market strategy, how did you think about the same sorts of points that, uh, that Aparna raised of identifying the buyer, identifying the need, and building your first, quote, go-to-market? How did you approach that? We uh, made a lot of mistakes <laughs> along the way. Is um, I think the mistakes are basically because of lack of data. I, I think this is very profound shift uh, to be a startup CEO rather than in a mature company. Uh, the huge difference is in a mature company, you have a huge amount of data. You can optimize to the extreme um, in terms of strategy, look back and forth and <laughs> trade-offs. But in a startup, oftentimes, there's not enough data. Um, if you want to be extreme data driven, then you get into analysis, analysis paralysis situation. So a lot of time we have to try and understand by trying understand what is our ideal customer profile, um, and hey, this conversation take way too long, and the conclusion is they are actually not our customer. Uh, the team incentive doesn't align, <laughs> uh, or um, the budget is actually not there. There's just pure interest, or um, or something else. So so that helps us really understand the parameters we should operate within. And the second is uh, help us also understand where is our strength 
in the market. And we have hypothesis when we start a company, of course. But only by um, going out there and have those conversations, then the real values start to surface. Um, I think without those mistakes, uh, it's really hard to realistically assess um, what's the biggest strength of our company. So right now, we establish us as uh, the leading vendor in uh, performance optimization and cost to serve. Um, and because the value is, um, hey, there's really low entrance to, to getting to Gen AI for product iteration and product scaling. And we even offer our product for free at app.fireworks.ai. And if you're interested, feel free to try it out. Um, and it's running on A100 GPUs, thanks to uh, GCP. <laughs> so it's all for, for, for you to try. And uh, constantly getting feedback is definitely uh, completely um, agree with that. And the feedback is, Interesting, uh, enterprise sometimes move quite slowly, mm -hmm. um, but we still manage to get in very deep engagement with them and constantly getting feedback because the, um, once we get past the stage of talking to CTOs, um, head of infra, head of AI, head of eng, head of product, then we are really talking with developers and engineers and they are very blunt and they give really good feedback. <laughs> I like how you slipped your go-to-market right into your answer and gave everyone the, uh, the, the URL they can go hit to start trying. So well done. You've clearly <laughs> done this a number of times. I appreciate that. There's maybe one point yeah. I just add. Uh, she reminded me of this. There's a really good uh, I don't know, phrase, I guess, on founder Twitter, which is uh, first-time founders care about product, second-time founders care about distribution. And not the second-time founders don't care about product, but I think distribution. That's matters Interesting. matters a whole lot. Yeah. Um, and then the one other thing I was going to say was uh, on the distribution note, your first five to 10 customers matter a lot mm. on the direction of your product. Um, I, I think they, they could make or break mm -hmm. how your trajectory goes. Right. Um, and so your first five to 10 customers, I, I think different, different companies have gone different strategies about this. Um, like a well-known company out there, Amplitude, went a very different strategy where they focused on the top product companies. Mm -hmm. And then you have other companies that went the bottoms-up approach where they'll start with hearing from startups first right. and then they bleed into enterprise. Um, I think for us, because we're, again, selling to enterprises as, as ML, ML observability, um, I think we were really lucky to have some top AI companies kind of be our early customers. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, was was really helpful in, in nailing out kind of that core value and prop and the yeah. product. So distribution, distribution, distribution. I love it. I actually love that phrase. The, as I hear the three of you talking, it just strikes me that um, you're all three founders, but it, it's clear you're also all three trailblazers in the sense of, you know, you, you're not none of you have created a product where there's a lot of other people doing what you're doing. None of you are picking technology that's super well understood in the industry. And so kudos to all three of you. I think it's super impressive. And um, clearly, uh, you like big challenges. And so it's great. It's great that you're all doing that. If I can pivot us a little bit away from product and kind of go to market and talk about another topic that I'm sure those folks in the room that are either founders or seeking to be founders care about, and that is capital. And so I'm curious, maybe Mona, we could start with you to share whatever you're comfortable sharing when it comes to how did you think about raising capital? And if you could, you know, the top one or two lessons that you could impart with these folks from a, a venture perspective would be great. Sure, so first thing is we bootstrapped it. Me and my co-founder, we, we wanted to feel passionately about what we did. So every founder does that, we bootstrapped uh, uh, with the cash that we had saved, we realized if you're building a product for enterprise, you're gonna run out of cash very quickly. So step two was yes, we would need cash, so we would, had to prototype something, prove it out. We were lucky we got into Y Combinator, so that was where our first check, external check came from. And then we started going out to do, I've done fundraising in two, uh, uh, like before the market kind of going uh, down. And then I raised one round earlier this year in the tough market, so I've seen it both. So uh, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. This market is hard to fundraise, but the good news is you can still fundraise if you have a very good idea which has a good product market approach. 
the validations is key. I would say look for right validations of like either through customer adoption, uh, customers intent to buy, showing the market potential. That helps a lot. That helped me a lot. I also feel fundraising is a little bit tricky. It's almost like sales. Uh, Aparna was talking about like channel distribution. Uh, as a founder, you're most of the time selling everything for talent, right? You want top launch talent, you want to raise funds, so you are selling your vision, how your product is different, all of that. So take fundraising as a sales exercise, to be honest. Segment the VCs you want to look after. Look at the VCs who have invested in the companies who understand your ecosystem, right? If you are a data infrastructure company, please go to companies or seed stage, if you're in seed stage, look at companies who are seed stages and who have invested in good data infrastructure movement. That will make your conversation much more easier. You will not feel disappointed because it's not a no for a no. Sometimes they are very different and they are not the right ICP in this context also for you. So that's the approach that worked for me personally, segmenting, finding the right type of ventures, right stage of companies that they invest in, companies who take that leap of faith on first time founders, that's also important, and like just go at it like sales and raise the funding. And if you have, which I highly recommend a co-founder, so business as usual, somebody's working on the other side of the house and you can work on fundraising because it takes time. Amazing. You know, one of the things, Aparna, that you mentioned, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll piggyback off of a comment and ask you, Lynn, this question and then give you some time to think about your answer. So giving you a, a break here. In a, in a world where you're solving problems that haven't been solved before, in a world where, in addition to customers, venture capitalists are also learning about yes. AI and learning about the problem, and Lynn, this is the question I'd ask you to, to answer for, for Fireworks. How did you go about raising your first round your, in a world where the people providing you the money may not also really understand what it is that you're trying to do in the first place? How did you approach that? And then a partner would love to hear from you as well. So my, my first round was very interesting. <laughs> and I only raised for one round, so <laughs> speaking <laughs> from experience. <laughs> um, I got connected uh, with an investor uh, through, uh, through a friend. And I think that investor immediately fell in love with, uh, with the idea I have. Uh, partly because I think I don't think I have any secret sauce. It's more like articulation of uh, user value and um, um, the market size and the tailwind, headwind, uh, and I can explain in depth uh, towards that. So, so and, and then that goes pretty smooth. I think it's, it's and I share with my friend, I, hey, I talk with the investor, he's shocked. Uh, why you start with that investor? You probably should, it's like interview, you should interview with some more company before you hit that one. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't know anything, but it seems it went well. I think the, I did homework and I, I, maybe it's something interesting to share. The homework I did is I worked with a very experienced, um, smaller investor who basically have seen a lot of pitch deck uh, and understand how to speak in investor's language. And basically, because I'm an engineer, um, you know, how to kind of, um, you know, properly um, paint the story that investor can understand uh, to Darren, to your point, they don't have a lot of deep background in, in specialty that we have and, um, you know, not to speak to the details, which they kind of were through them off, but really help them understand the business case and the market size and why, why us, uh, why now? And so those questions very well, and then uh, the rest should be very easy. Basically, he helped me establish a communication channel uh, with the investors. I think that's really helpful. If you can find someone, especially if a first time um, founder in the first round, if you can find someone who can help you, shape up your pitch deck, um, to me, it's tremendously useful. Great. Aparna, what about from your perspective? Same question. Of how, how did you raise that first round in a world that maybe didn't understand you? <laughs> yeah, no, good, good question. So, um, so, so far, uh, I've raised three rounds, our seed, 
or Series A or Series B. Mm -hmm. Each round, I feel like, was a different thing that you're, you're trying to prove. Mm -hmm. Seed, you're trying to prove, to be honest, market. How big is the market for a product like yours? At this stage, to be honest, I feel like what most investors are looking for is like, do you have the background? It's kind of like founder market fit. Mm -hmm. Are you a right founder for this market? Mm -hmm. And how big is your market? To be honest, the bigger the market, the better the hope for the investor that you're going to kind of fumble your way around and you'll find mm. a need in this market. And so market's always more important, <laughs> I'd say. And so for me, the um, AI space, that, that's kind of, I, I'd, you know, I, I think my seed round was a lot of here's a need, had felt the need before, here's other people, here's more people like me. I am one ML engineer, but there's, I think at that point it was like the third or fourth fastest growing job on yeah. LinkedIn, a job role on LinkedIn. And so if you could prove, hey, similar to how DBT was the product for data analysts, it's kind of like, will you be the product for ML engineers? I and see. so can you attach your, d different companies go about it in different ways, but are you gonna be a product for a role? Mm -hmm. Are you gonna be, this function will be done by this product? And so what's your market uh, and how big is it? I, and are you the right founder right. to solve that market? I think by Series A, you're starting to get into, do you have proof points of your validation? So do you have enough of a spread of good logos? And um, what's your, how much are people willing to pay for a product like your product? Um, and so for us, like, you want a spread of, I think, good logos, mm -hmm. because the quality of the logos matters. You, you also don't want like a big whale deal that's that's you know most of your revenue. You want to show that there's diversity, multiple yeah. diversity mm -hmm. of people purchasing your product, um, and it's okay if you're like, hey, I'm gonna only focus for our first year. Um, we focused entirely on what do you call uh, you know call it fintechs um, and call it uh, tech first enterprises. So think about it like uh, the Etsy's, the Wayfarers. Those were kind of like our um, Stitch Fix, like those were kind of companies where like, they're tech first, they definitely have ML, these are companies that we're gonna focus on. And um, I think that that, if you can kind of show, hey, this is a, a vertical, even if you may not, you might be vertical agnostic, but you can kind of prove, we've tested this vertical, we've tested that vertical, and you know, you're kind of showing proof that you're, the the kind of hypothesis that you had and right. when you're raising your seed, you've kind of validated Making some progress. of that. Right. And then by the time I feel like you get to your B, it becomes about can you scale your business in an economic way. Um, and so I, I think what are you trying to prove in each round and can you clearly prove it um, is, 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 you know, I, I think something that, um, I, I didn't realize until we were like going through the motions of doing it. Yeah, I think that's incredible experience and having three rounds now under your belt and you're a bit of an expert now. So thank <laughs> you for, for sharing that. And I hope that success continues for you. Um, so let's continue uh, from a product perspective before we run out of time. One of the things that we promised was that talking about identifying a big problem, iterating around customer requirements to release a, a great product, but I would love for you to say what's coming next. And so would you each mind, if you're able to, share a little bit about what your customers can expect from your product and maybe give us some insight into behind the curtain, what's coming next. So Lynn, do you maybe want to start from a fireworks perspective? Put you on the spot. Yeah, definitely. I love to be on that spot. Uh, so our, our products mainly focus on um, developer productivity and uh, kind of if we when we think about the product developers, we really look into think them into two cohorts. One is they are in product market fit proving phase, validation phase. And in that phase, what's most important is speed of iteration. That means, um, hey, whatever is getting in the way and slowing them down, that we, ha we need to remove those. Um, in terms of, uh, so where, where they do they spend time? One is, hey, they have a business problem at hand, they don't know how to decompose that into AI problems. That's the first, which AI model to use. And then how do I fine tune models? It's a black magic. Um, and then after I fine tune, how do I even test that, and test my product experience, how to deploy? So we want to really make this iteration fast. So that's the problem we are in the process of solving. That's what's coming next is really 
make the whole experiment, product experiment on Gen AI going really, really fast. What we have like a good handle on is actually the second phase, the outer loop. The outer loop is once you have a product market fit, you add a scale of uh, add the stage of scaling to a lot more uh, users, and then you worry about a different kind of problem. You worry about performance, stability, reliability, uh, cost to serve, all this problem, business problem more coming to picture. So we, we chose to solve the second problem first because we feel that's a much bigger barrier. Um, and, uh, and it's much easier for us to identify the distribution channel for those um, um, stakeholders, so that's, we, that's why we solved the outer loop problem first. Um, and uh, I think, as I just mentioned, I think Fireworks is um, one of the best vendors when it comes to performance, uh, scalability, and cost to serve. So if you are in the second category, we would love for you to try our platform, but um, we are also um, heading towards solving the inner circle problem to make, if you are in the product market fit stage, building on top of Gen AI, uh, we are going to roll out product that uh, you can also use, and please give us feedback. Excellent. Mona, what about for you? What's coming next? What can you share with us? We have a fantastic launch coming up. And as Aparna mentioned that, you know, as we adopt and iterate on the product, we also iterate on go-to-market. We realize enterprise is where we want to sit. Enterprise is where our adoption is going to be highest. So what do they care about? They definitely care about being easy, where they get their other uh, cloud services. So we launched on Marketplace last week. That's a first thing that they'll start, they'll be able to use their GCP credits to leverage Telmai, and especially given it's a new category, everybody's learning how this product is going to sit into the ecosystem, so that adoption barrier is going to be easy. Secondly, we are going to uh, have Telmai in your accounts, GCP accounts running. We were a public SaaS offering, but now Telmai could run in your environment, whether it's AWS, GCP, Azure. So we launched that. And we've also added a lot of feature functionalities, which makes it easy. So we call this release, we are calling it more enterprise adoption. Uh, uh, release, so which is like functionalities like enterprises have heterogeneous systems in their data pipelines. They have multiple systems in a single data pipeline. We are going to support all these different systems, reading data from that in their ecosystem, uh, checking for data drifts across different systems, where is the data missing, so those type of functionality. And another exciting one is data binning. So especially when you're training your models, large data, large language models, or um, be it your traditional machine learning models, you need to profile the data, understand how much of this data is good, bad, and whether it's from cost perspective or model per performance perspective, you, you want to separate your bad data from good data from the pipeline. So that will be also launched in this release. So a lot of exciting stuff. We're continuously building, continuously learning, and making it easy for folks to adopt products like Telmine. Amazing, excellent. Aparna, what's up next? All right, well, we started 2020 on ML observability. Um, at that point, LLMs wasn't, wasn't a thing. Uh, <laughs> so earlier this year, we launched support for LLM observability. So I feel like every week, I talk to somebody in C-suite of some company and they're telling us their number one most important use case is to get out a generative application. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, by the way, are using Google's uh, Palm 2, Text by Sun 2. So we launched support um, actually just this week for um, kind of building on top of all of our LLM launches to now do prompt iteration, prompt monitoring, um, and also troubleshoot uh, retrieval augmented generate, you know, the, the proprietary data that people are adding into wow. their prompts. Mm -hmm. So if you're pulling in irrelevant proprietary data into your prompts, you can now observe that, troubleshoot it, drill down into what's yeah. wrong, um, and then fix that. And all of this is also available on our open source product as well. Amazing. That's great. It's great to see the level of iteration and the new announcements. So thanks for giving us a little bit of the peek behind the curtain. Let's kind of bring us home with one final question. And um, Mona, maybe I'll start with you. And that is of the folks here in this room who may be thinking of or in their early days of starting a company focused on providing a capability to an enterprise that will kind of be a bit of a key. What is the number one, you have to pick one, the number one piece of advice 
that you would share with individuals in this crowd about starting that company and being successful? I know it's hard to pick one, but I'm going to ask you to pick one. But I'm going to tell a very simple answer. Just start. Like, it, there it. is nothing exciting than starting a company, doing something that you believe in. And this is the perfect time. I mean, the ecosystem, the support, there is tremendous amount of it. Don't overthink this. Just jump into it, do it. There's no failures, OK? There's only learnings in startup journey. There's no failures. Uh, I've spoken to so many founders, even the top founders who have built multi-billion dollar type of companies have failed and embraced failures. And so it is a journey. And learn from that, but just get started. Incredible. That's amazing advice. Thank you. And Lynn, what about from you? The single piece of advice, most important advice. Build trust. So, uh, like, uh, look at the enterprise, right? So they, they are not agile. They're kind of not like startup moving really fast and kind of they can switch uh, dependencies quickly and so on. Enterprise has a long process to make those decisions. And uh, for enterprise to use a startup, especially early stage startup, they are creating dependencies uh, on, on a you know, rising company who are yet to prove their reputation. So um, I think for their, a lot of their decision making is based on how much trust they have, uh, how much validation they have, how much they trust this team is going to deliver high quality um, product and so on. I, I, I personally feel like um, it, it takes time to, to build that trust, to build that reputation, um, and you lend one and then you, you know you, you can build on top of that. And, and this is a process. It's, it's kind of cannot be rushed. Um, it, it just, you just have to have the patience to kind of um, grind through that and, and get to a level that you, you have proven um, your you know, value towards multiple ones and then you can build on top of that. So I, I feel it's kind of like, building a pyramid, you have to kind of lay out a foundation step by step and, and then kind of build on top of it. Excellent, thank you. Aparna. Cool, mine's is easy, velocity. Whatever you can do to maintain velocity, that's your secret sauce as a startup at the end of the day. You're just gonna move 100 times faster than a large enterprise, mm -hmm. maybe 1,000 times. And so every single decision that you make, think about it as, um, is this, you know, how do I, is this helping me move faster? And that could be from, I'll, I'll give a Google plug, because um, you guys invited me so nicely. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, everything from like, you know, setting up infra. Our eng picked Google Cloud because you don't have to have a big, large team as you scale. Mm -hmm. I think the faster that you can get up and get your entire stack up running is important. Um, I think as fast as you can get a product out to market is important. And then I think there's kind of like a personal journey you go through, right? You're never great at everything when you first start. Mm -hmm. um, you have many weaknesses. And so figure out your own velocity of, of where you're weak at and how do you get better at that. And for many of the technical founders here, it, it might just be go to market. And so like how, how quickly can you increase your own velocity to you know, pitch and get 20 pitches in mm -hmm. as quickly as possible? I think that that kind of makes or breaks you early on. That's incredible. What I find interesting about the way all three of you wrap this up is that's good just life advice, frankly. So what I'm taking away, and I'm not the founder of a startup, is just get started, don't overthink it, and be willing to accept the risk of potentially not doing something perfectly and move forward. Build trust with the people that you're building the company with and you're building the company for, realizing that people are always gonna make a bet on you and that trust is gonna matter, and move freaking fast, right? And do things as quickly as you can and be willing to break a little bit of glass. I think that's incredibly powerful for founders, incredibly powerful for trailblazers, which as I said, I really believe all three of you are. And even those of us in the room that are not founders or trailblazers, that's advice we can take and start applying today. So really I'll just add it. one last thing. Yeah. If you're starting a company, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, so move fast, but it's a marathon. <laughs> Don't burn yourself out in the I did that. I thought I had to be up, not watch TV, not do my yoga. Uh, I cannot miss a moment. And then I realized, no, you have to figure that out, and I don't know how you both feel about it, but it's so important, and that's also a life advice, it's a great, right? Yeah, wrapped you in mental health, to, you right? you got to focus and find your ground every so often because, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I think it's like, how do you, in the long run, I think, maintain velocity? Correct, I think exactly, that's, yeah. Love it. 
Excellent. Well, we thank everyone for ending your day with us. I hope you've had an opportunity to take away a nugget or two or three from these trailblazing founders that we have on the stage. Thank you so much to all three of you. And I know thank we'll have some time to say hello. So thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you, sir.